Western pleasure to welcome you to Environmental Coffee House tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about a very important thing that's happening on our earth right now, and that is none other than sea level rise. So as the earth is getting hotter every year, the cryosphere is melting. That's all the masses of ice all over the world, and that's going to be causing immense and exponential sea level rise. So we're going to, I'm just going to let you know where we're going. So I'm going to give you a 30,000 foot overview of our adventure with sea level rise tonight. And uh, also Nick and Antonio, I'm so honored to be with you guys tonight. Love doing shows with you guys. So Antonio is going to kick it off for us tonight with an article from InsideClimateNews.org. And this is Global Ice Loss on Pace to Drive Worst Case Sea Level Rise. New study combines ice melt data from all sources to reaffirm one of the most serious climate change threats. And then we're going to segue over to an article from The Guardian. These are all new articles. This one just came out two days ago on Monday, January 25th, 2021. This is a global ice loss accelerating at record rate, study finds. Rate of loss now in line with worst case scenarios of the intergovernmental panel on climate change. As we all know, the intergovernmental channel uh, panel on climate change or the IPCC has been overly conservative consistently. Then we will be segueing over to an article from earthsky.org uh, entitled Earth is losing ice at record rate. Then we will go over to an article actually from williamandmary.org entitled U.S. Sea Level Report Cards 2020 Again Trends Toward Acceleration. And we'll be finishing up tonight with a localized uh, ice report from Tahoe. As storm sets up to pummel Tahoe, meteorologists forecast a future without snow, and this is from SF Gate. So that's our show tonight, where we're going and why it's so important. So, Antonia, would you like to uh, launch us off on this sea level rise adventure tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction, and thank you uh, to our audience for joining us in this most important dialogue and discussion about the state of our planet, and most particular about the cryosphere and sea level. Um, unfortunately, brothers and sisters, the news that I have to share tonight is uh, grim. It's sobering and eye-opening. Um, the latest data that we're looking at in terms of sea level rise is, well, I'll just use the words of the researcher, uh, faster than ever uh, and huge um, in terms of the projections that are we are now looking forward to. Um, so this was triggered essentially by the fact that we are losing so much of the cryosphere um, across North America, Asia, Africa, well, all of our continents. Um, of course, the cryosphere exists most abundantly in Antarctica and Greenland, but of course, uh, our more uh, mid-latitude continents have a lot of uh, glaciers that are withering away. And in fact, the research shows that we've seen robust declines in glaciers uh, throughout uh, the mid-latitudes since the 1950s, and this trend has ultimately been accelerating. Um, quite unfortunately, the rate in 2017 uh, was about 1.3 trillion uh, tons of ice degradation from the glacier shelves. Uh, which is up from 0 0.8 trillion in 1990. Um, so you can see that we're almost losing twice as much ice uh, as we were in the 90s, which again was an absolutely phenomenal time um, in terms of glacier ice melts. Um, so this is triggering uh, higher expectations and predictions for sea level rise into the future. Um, it's driving us to the worst case scenarios 
according to the IPCC um, fifth assessment, uh, as in its most latest update, um, sea level rise in the cryosphere. Um, the worst projections show that we're headed toward two to three feet of sea level rise this century, um, close to 2050, 2060. Um, whereas really in the interim of the last 10 years, our best science from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had the trajectory of sea level rise to be close to worst case scenario, three feet. Um, but now it looks that we'll be getting that three feet, that one meter sea level rise closer to the middle of the century um, as opposed toward the end of the century. Um, the rate of ice rate has accelerated essentially by 65% from 94 to 17, uh, which represents a profound level of change. Um, notice though that um, the amount of ice degradation that we've seen is a result of a global average temperature of, well, just this year or 2020, racked it at uh, two point or 1.2 three degrees Celsius or close to that range. Um, and so we're really seeing that even below that safe threshold, that UN safeguard of one and a half degrees, um, we are locking in quite devastating amounts of sea level rise. Um, the researchers also point out that if we look at the geologic past uh, in Earth's history, we can see that sea level rise is actually quite dynamic. Um, and we are now have enough CO2 in the atmosphere to trigger, uh, as the researchers point out, sea level rise will be going on for centuries. This is not something that's only gonna impact the people of the 21st century, but this will also be uh, even more catastrophic for the people of the 22nd century and beyond, um, we will see. Uh, and what they say is that we actually have about 20 meters of sea level rise locked in at the 420 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere that we currently have today. Um, so that is a level of sea rise that is expected to be realized in the coming centuries. Um, However, sea level rise is expected to be very dynamic every decade throughout this century. Um, on average, we have gotten about 1.2 to 1.9 inches of sea level rise um, a decade. But we are going to, according to these uh, later scenarios going to be getting in several inches and even feet uh, as we get closer to the end of the 21st century. Um, this level of sea rise is estimated, of course, to devastate global uh, coastal uh, areas, ecology, and of course, human infrastructure. Uh, the difference between one foot of sea level rise by the end of the century and three feet of sea level rise by 2050 is truly orders of magnitude different. It really is hard to explain um, how the world policymakers will have to react, um, how they can react to these really radically uh, starkly different sea level rise approaches that, that we're now seeing, um, taking in the most um, up-to-date knowledge on rapid deglaciation, on calving, uh, which is something that happens when warmer water uh, kind of carves out under the glacier leaving it exposed and then it just drops off into the ocean. Um, and this effect is essentially unstoppable. And so 
the researchers believe that these phenomena, these feedbacks, um, have triggered the worst case scenario according to the IPCC. Um, and that's over a meter of sea level rise by the end of the century. Maybe two meters of sea level rise. Um, and so this is something that governments are going to have to respond to. We are going to see migration impacted by this. We're going to see the livelihood of states impacted by this. We're going to see fisheries impacted by increasing levels of sea level rise. Countries like Bangladesh already uh, being pounded by the impacts of sea level rise. If we look at Malaysia, if we look at Indonesia, if we look at America, Samoa, and many other island countries, we really are talking about an unprecedented scenario uh, that policymakers just two or three years ago could not conceive of now being driven to the mainstream. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say that I was just going to say that um, I think when people think about sea level rise, they think about it as a creep and um, very gradual, but it's the, uh, the acceleration that's really killer. Um, correctly, since 1880, we've had about like eight or 10 inches of sea level rise globally. And it's 20, you know, 2021 now, but to have another, you know, potentially two or three feet in just the next, um, you know, 30 or 40 years. And then, and and then even more feet of sea level rise going to a 2100. It's, it's absolutely devastating because to, to have that comparatively gradual sea level rise since 1880, you could, you adapt to that. You can you can change your the your shipping, your ports, the way things are designed, raise raise uh, buildings or move them inland. Um, but when you start getting into feet um, in a matter of a few decades, and then and then uh, multiple feet, then you you can't adapt fast enough, and you start having problems with everything from um, port industry to agriculture that happens to be on the coastline to housing uh, people have to move away housing uh, fails um, the, the economics of housing completely fail and you get um, you know migrations of people that can't live in a certain area anymore because of the uh, water table gets flooded with salt water uh, there's just all sorts of problems all sorts of huge huge challenges that come from having sea level ex- uh, rise accelerates so drastically and i don't i don't think people really um have have this idea in mind uh, you know they they think of it just as a very gradual creep and, it, and it'll be something that we can adapt to but it's, there's a point when uh, humans can't adapt and you have um, um lo- local and regional collapse of, e- of economies and of agriculture and of the ability to live off the land because the land is just rapidly going underwater and not to, and that doesn't even talk about uh, even extreme events such as storms hurricanes that will take advantage of that sea level rise to cause greater damage farther inland um, as a result of the rise in water yeah yeah i just kind of like to point out too good points uh both of you antonio and nick is that we are right now interglacial, meaning that in the last 14,000 years, mostly from 10,000 years ago to 6,000 years ago, there was a huge amount of sea level rise as the Ice Age came to an abrupt end. And we can talk about that in other shows. But the point of it is, is that sea level has already risen about 430 feet since the height of the last ice age. So we are interglacial. 
there are about 220 feet left in terms of ice. But there are many things that cause sea level rise. Obviously, when the big ice sheets melt, that causes intensive sea level rise. But also as the ocean warms and warm water expands and it actually increases. So as the ocean warms and it is warming, that's going to cause a great deal of sea level rise. And as well, there's land subsidence, right? So basically when the land subsides, as it is in many places, you mentioned um, Antonio uh, Jakarta. So Jakarta is the capital of Indonesia. Um, so Jakarta is in Indonesia and um that land is subsiding. Another huge band of land that is subsiding is along the east coast of the United States. Um, you know, we talk about Virginia Beach, but this land subsidence really affects most of the east coast of, of the United States, meaning that land is going down already as a natural course, you know, matter of course. So those are three things that affect sea level rise. And, you know, the other thing is, is that there's the exponential nature of sea level rise, and it's very difficult to comprehend the inertia and the momentum of this meltdown experience that we're currently engaged in, and it is unstoppable from a ice melt perspective, you know, once the ice starts melting, it takes a while to come to fruition, and it is a slow sort of creep experience, as both of you guys have mentioned. But as time goes on, it just seems to get faster and faster as it exponentiates. Now, the IPCC has been incredibly conservative to a fault, um, to the point where I just seem to discount a lot of the estimates that I hear from the IPCC, because every time you turn around, they're having to revise their estimates. Because typically the IPCC, I don't know why, but it maybe they're not complex thinkers, or maybe it's the lowest common denominator, but whatever it is, the IPCC um, always comes up way too conservative, and they don't seem to take in the exponential nature. They don't seem to take in the self-reinforcing feedbacks and all of the different factors that affect these things. So, um, you know, I, I tend to think that they've got a long way to go in proving their, their estimates with um, sea level rise. So the momentum part and the inertia part and the exponentiation part, all of this, you know, adds up to a picture that's really grim. And I tend to be much more aggressive in my estimates. And it's just my own feeling. Everybody's going to have their own take on it. But I tend to think that it's going to be a lot more than like two or three feet by the end of this century. I tend to think that it could be, you know, probably as much as five meters, you know, which is like 16 feet. And that's quite possible. Now, when you consider all of the infrastructure that you guys have talked about, the Navy, the ports, you know, let's talk about airports too, right? There are a lot of airports that are extended, like the San Francisco airport's a perfect example. That's extended right out into the San Francisco Bay, and they're having to build a little seawall around that, you know, Tokyo airport, all these, a lot of these airports, you know, the airports came along after the cities were developed. And if the cities were on the sea, you know, just putting a bunch of rubble and landfill like that, it was a great place to build an airport, you know, free land, right? All you had to do is make it until it's not good anymore. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is like um, the space shuttle, you know, Cape Canaveral, where the space shuttle, um, you know, takes off. That thing is built right out in the marshes there in Florida. And, um, you know, there's so much infrastructure that's just basically – I mean, it's it, it's it's going to all hit around the same time 
because uh, the sea level will rise a couple of feet and then all of a sudden you just can't you can't take any more sea level rise you can only raise the roads so much you know Miami's already been raising the roads there's absolutely no way to build a seawall in Florida um, because it's just you know, very porous limestone. And as you mentioned, Nick, um, the saltwater intrusions as the sea level rises, all those aquifers are going to get salinated mm -hmm. and therefore, um, you know, rend. And that's going to cause water shortages and the housing market could very well collapse. So we're on a losing battle with the sea level rise. And eventually all this ice is going to melt because it's on a sort of delayed response. But, you know, in the meantime, we're going to be fighting what I think is probably ultimately um, going to be losing battle. was wondering uh, what you guys thought of that, either of you. Well, my yeah. first comment on that is that uh, in 2011, the International Energy Agency uh, in partnership with the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, working off the estimates that were published in 2007 from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which had their most extreme scenario was three foot. And the expectation at the time was that we were going to have 18 to 54 centimeters, uh, so between six inches to one and a half foot of sea level rise by the end of the century. And uh, these organizations got together and essentially wrote some safeguards and protocols uh, that they were trying to get coastal nuclear facilities to adhere to. Uh, of course, you know, nuclear facilities are just one of the many, as you say, infrastructures that will be impacted by this. But in particular, they were warning that uh, coastal nuclear facilities were particularly vulnerable to future sea level rise. And that they were warning that uh, coastal facilities should begin preparing for um, that range of 18 centimeters to 54 centimeters of sea level rise. And that was in 2011, that was 10 years ago. Um, needless to say, facilities have not um, made those type of capital investments to uh, upgrade their security basis to respond to those levels of sea level rise. And now we've just been bombarded with um, projections that are astronomically higher than that range that was that was given to operators and utilities to prepare for. Um, and I think that that's a microcosm of the type of challenges that uh, countries will be facing around the world. Uh, is how do we prepare for this on an individual basis? How do insurers uh, prepare, prepare for this? How do utilities prepare for this? Um, how do local districts prepare for this? Or just like you say, um, and we can't just make the option to abandon this infrastructure. People are talking about um, strategic retreat from the coastline, and I certainly do think that's appropriate where possible, um, but Again, thinking about this nuclear issue, decommissioning is a 20 to 60 year process and the sorts of sea level rise scenarios that are now being realized um, really put that sort of planning outside of the realm of feasibility. Um, so I think that this is, uh, like I say, quite devastating news. Um, I don't know how governments are going to react to this. And I think in part, Jennifer, if I could speak to your concern about the IPCC's conservatism, um, I don't know. I mean, I, how do you think governments will take um, the IPCC going in this direction? I mean, already there is so much opposition against the IPC for even talking about the world headed toward uh, one half degrees by 2030. And this, these implications of sea level rise are certainly much more devastating than that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of um, politics is, well, it's just stating the obvious, I guess a lot of politics is involved with the IPCC, a lot of scientists 
you know, whether they're um, involved with the IPCC directly or, or not, or use their research, don't necessarily want to admit it or talk about the, you know, the politics that's involved. But I mean, it's clear that, that governments don't want to necessarily um, have some very dire um, aspects of, of some of the research that's coming out um, out there in the open, or at least not considered a, a, a um, headline scenario. I mean, I mean we've had, um, obviously, Paul Beckwith has talked about the potential for multimeter sea level rise going into the 2060s, 2070s. I mean, even James Hansen um, wrote a paper uh, like four or five years ago on um, sea level rise and superstorms. It was called, it's easy to find on the internet for anybody. Um, uh, that and Paul Beckwith actually did videos on it as well for a few, three or four years ago. Um, that that discusses the potential based on the doubling time of sea level sea level rise currently. Um, that you could have multimeter sea level rise going into say in the second half of the 20th century. Multimeter sea level rise, so you know a foot by or a meter by 2060 or something. And then it just exponentiates further going into the 2070s, 2080s. I mean, it, much of what is um, wor- worrisome about sea level rise is based on the fi- the physics of the collapse of the ice sheets from Antarctica. I mean, Greenland gets a lot of attention and obviously it's, it's bad at what's going on in Greenland right now, even with the loss of ice the past uh, few years, but Antarctica is 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 kind of the uh, the tipping point. If it if you start losing tons of ice off of off that huge ice sheet of Antarctica, then you start um, really accelerating sea level rise dramatically. And and the more, especially this decade, the more research has been done this past decade on Antarctica the scarier the outlook is for sea level rise because everyone starts to realize, oh, the the warm warming waters um, underneath the glaciers the, that jut out um, and uh, the bedrock being below sea level in Antarctica, the more the waters warm, the faster the ice pours out from the inner, inner region of the continent out into the ocean raising the sea level because that's water that's coming directly, ice is coming directly off the land. Um, and the more that accelerates, the faster sea level rise will accelerate as a result. And, and um, I mean, it, I think, I think that the IPCC, it gets, um, you know, a lot of mainstream climate scientists, they're trying to um, maintain its credibility because they don't want um, the opposite thing to happen, whereas climate deniers will deny the credibility of the IPCC for the sake of trying to to to, to raise the raise the level of climate denial in the world. Um, so a lot of climate scientists will defend the IPCC. I I think the IPCC serves a perp- serves some purpose in 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 political. Um, um, uh, sh- uh, pushing towards trying to make some changes um, to avert cri- uh, the worst case scenario in in global uh, climate change, but in the process of being so conservative because they don't want to scare the heck out of people, <laughs> they don't really communicate very well that the worst case scenarios seem to be more in line with reality than not. And it may, and in fact reality may far exceed the worst case scenario. We may be facing multimeter sea level rise this century, which would absolutely devastate civilization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And due to the exponential nature and how fast the sea level rise rate exponentiates, the amount of sea level rise can be vastly different. And Antonio was going to speak to um, a sea level rise projection graphic. Um, you know, I know that Paul Beckwith made several videos about sea level rise, dozens probably, but one in particular that that kind of sticks in my mind 
is the one where he was talking about up to seven meters of sea level rise by 2070. That's 28 feet. Now that sounds absolutely huge. And that's those types of figures are not even on that sea level rise graphic. Um, so, you know, that is all due to the exponentiation. Um, you know, all of that sea level rise happens kind of at the last moment, um, you know, as, as things double and double and double and double again, then, you know, in those last years, you get a lot of sea level rise. And of course, what happens, you know, the next century and the following century, well, that's the end of all of our coastal cities. Yeah. There is and this can we bring level... up that graphic on the um, level of sea rise so that people can see exactly what uh, the researchers are estimating and then comparing that to what uh, Jennifer is talking about. So if we can get that graphic uh, showing the different ensembles, what the projections will be by the end of the century again. So this is a graph about the possible future sea level rises for uh, different greenhouse pathways. There's a couple of things I wanna say about this graph. So obviously you can see it goes from 1880 to 2100. There hasn't been a lot of sea level rise uh, comparatively to now what is expected um, since all of us have been born. But as you can see that there are uh, six different pathways uh, the lower blue ones, these were the pathways essentially that the IPCC is working upon. Um, and these were the pathways that were put forth as possible scenarios with the intermediate low being the most likely um, level of sea level rise that was projected by the intergovernmental panel on climate change. But as you can see, this is the graphic from NOAA, which I think is a much more serious organization when it comes to understanding sea level rise because, of course, NOAA has to work in conjunction with the United States Navy uh, and the Pentagon. Um, and I think that they are much more willing to accept uh, the dynamics of sea level rise in order to prepare for them. And so what we ended up getting toward the end of the century for NOAA uh, is something like three times as much sea level rise as the lower end projection. Um, you saw the extreme end is in meters, two point five meters um, of sea level rise. And for every one meter, it's three feet. Um, so we are talking about almost eight to 10 feet of sea level rise now possible uh, for just the 21st century. Um, as you saw by 2050 is when we are getting what the IPCC thought was the worst case scenario, uh, three feet. Um, so now we're in for three feet by 2050, not 2100. Uh, and again, this is what the IPC thought was the worst case, three feet by 2100. And now the expectation is three feet by the middle of the century. Mm, that's very interesting, Antonio. And when you add in the extreme exponentiation, because to my mind, and maybe I'm just too aggressive in my estimates, even the exponentiation on the extreme one is like too flat. It's not like, I picture it more going like up, up, and then it's just like gunk because all the glaciers are coming off Antarctica and melting all the ice plugs and the ice sheets are melted you know so you've got extreme melting in Antarctica at that time and then the extreme heating that's hitting the ocean as well and that's going to make the ocean that much bigger because you know hot water is bigger in volume than um than cooler water so I think it's possible that it's going to be you know, very well twice what's shown on that graph. What what do you think about that? Um, I think that there's a good possibility that we're going to see higher levels than what is even now being currently reported because these dynamics, um, we also have to understand that, look, they're based off of greenhouse gas pathways um, and they're trying to render, well, what will be the global average temperature at those uh, approximate points? 
And we already know that these organizations are conservative when it comes to global average temperature. And we also know, and you've stated this quite well in the past, Jennifer, about the uh, polar amplification process. And of course, both poles will be even greater amplified as we go through global warming. So I am afraid <laughs> that uh, in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna be looking at these uh, projections as rather conservative. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it this way, you, the, the feedback, and James Hansen spoke about this a little bit, is you get more um, melting of ice from, from Greenland, um, that raises sea levels, the ocean is warming, you get raised warm water impinging upon the glaciers that are exiting uh, Antarctica, or yeah, Antarctica, um, the ones that are that have bedrock that's below sea level, that warms the ice, causing the ice in Antarctica to accelerate, raising sea level even faster. So it's a, uh, and uh, that has impacts back in Greenland as well. So you, so you have this feedback between Greenland and Antarctica causing ice to, uh, to, uh, to accelerate off the ice sheets and um, cause sea level to accelerate even faster than it was previously. So it's, a, uh, it's an interesting paper. People should go look for it. But um, it's definitely a situation where you could have um, crazy amounts of sea level rise very quickly after 2050. You know, even by 2050, it's going to be uh, um, starting to have devastating impacts on uh, Pacific Island nations, on um, places that are currently near sea level in Louisiana, Florida, uh, Bangladesh. Um, just pick pick your place. There's going to be um, starting to have places starting to have serious impacts from sea level rise in the next uh, 15 to 30 years. And then after 30 years, it's going to probably get pretty crazy and severe impacts economically, politically, um, agriculturally. Um, it's, it's, it's a big deal. I mean, it, it's funny, you know, you know, people, um, especially doomer types usually think of sea level rise as the last issue of concern, but it may actually be the thing that, that knocks us out um, because it's, it's actually something else that, goes up exponentially, not just dealing with global average temperature and extreme heat events and other things that can devastate um, ecosystems and agriculture, but sea level rise is one of those things that is not slow either. It's going, it's going to go fast. It's going to go very fast at some point. <clears throat> and I, I always like to turn in mind to history, right? So, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, we've already gone up about um, sea level rise has gone up about 430 feet in the last 14,000 years. Now, what did that look like? What did Earth look like prior to the beginning of the end of the last ice age, right? So when the ice age was at its height uh, and there was 430 feet, the sea was 430 feet lower than it is today, what did the coastline look like and how can we see evidence of that sea level rise today? Now, if you look along the east coast of the United States, it's a perfect example. You, did you all play um, a game called Connect the Dots? Like probably you guys are like too young, but yeah, Connect the Dots. That was like a really big game when I was growing up. We didn't have computers, right? So um if you do the connect the dots on the east coast of the United States and kind of like pull it out and get a depth map of the oceans and how deep that ocean is, right, and get exactly how that coastline looked, you know, it's really easy to see how these intrusions go up rivers and they look at the east coast of the United States, how windy it is and stuff. Look at the Chesapeake Bay. Look at the barrier islands along South Carolina and North Carolina. Nags Head, 
Cape Hatteras. You know, you do the connect the dots and you pull it out and you can see what the effects of sea level rise have been already, right? And we don't think much about that, but it's very fascinating to think, how did these coastlines look 14,000 years ago when the Ice Age was at its height before it had really started melting? And then the impact really starts to hit home. And you see um, how the, when the sea level starts rising, how it goes up these river things and these river uh, mouths become like absolutely huge. So play that game with yourself. Another good um, example of it <clears throat> that's uh, a little less close to home for us here in the United States is over in India. And to understand how the sea level rise over the last 14,000 years really affected the coastline of India. And especially if you look over by Pakistan in western, northwestern India, there is a place called the Gulf of Kambay. And there's this little peninsula sitting out there called Dwarka, the, the city of Dwarka. And there are a couple of little islands. Well, guess what? Those things were not always islands. And that bulk, Gulf of Kambe used to just be fertile land. So we're going to be losing some of our most fertile land. Another place to examine is in um, the Mekong Delta in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia and Vietnam, right? That is some of the most fertile land on earth. And that is the breadbasket. And it's all it, it's all very flat there. <clears throat> it's all Mekong Delta. And whenever you have deltas, of course, by their very nature, deltas are flat because they're usually kind of like sandbars or stuff that's washed down the river, right? But those things are all going to get intruded with salt water. And some of the most fertile lands are there in um, in Vietnam and, and Cambodia, and they're going to be completely intruded by salt water. And that's all rice growing lands right now. The other scary thing, if you look at a detail map um, of Bangladesh, right, and you can see the same behavior, it's like this very kind of crazy curvy um, uh, coastline, right, and you can see how the water has intruded and is continuing to intrude and they have massive loss of uh, farmland there in Bangladesh every single year and it's they're trying to hold it off with like mangroves and all these things but it's it's irrevocable and it's it continues to march on and it's happening um, faster and faster um, every day so yeah i just think that's and, interesting. Uh, uh, another place that most people aren't thinking about because they're not thinking about multimeter sea level rise is the central valley of california that's gonna oh. <laughs> uh, yeah the, uh, the water from the bays there it will eventually intrude on the central valley if you start getting uh, multi-meter sea level rise, but nobody considers multi-meter sea level rise in this century. So and it's a serious thing right now. So uh, nobody in California is fearing sea level rise in that aspect, but um, Central Valley, California, that will become a new bay, <laughs> a new lake um, as sea level rise intrudes and on it from San Francisco and Monterey Bays. Yeah. And of course, that Central Valley is some of the most fertile land. That is the vegetable basket of the United States. And we're going to lose that if the sea level, well, I wouldn't say if, I should say when, right? When the sea level continues and it will intrude and it will kind of creep along through the San Francisco Bay and then boom, it's just going to be flooded and once it's flooded with salt water i think that pretty much ruins the land yeah and there's yeah. secondary and peripheral effect to this so particularly in the in our industrial civilizations but across the coast uh, around the world so essentially this means that our our coastlines will become super fun sites um as i mean look at i think about images of uh you know the tsunami 
uh, the 2004 tsunami that hit uh, Sri Lanka and Indonesia, India, and that part of the world. And, you know, I think about the power of the sea and how much it's able to do. But this is something that's even quite apart from that. No, it's not going to be one dramatic effect um, like a tsunami. It's going to be a relentless and an roar. And that roar gets louder and louder and louder and louder. And so I just, I, I think about this growing, the, our coastline would just be muck. You know, it will be a water waste world of industrial waste, of our uh, buildings standing alone. Um, and well, they'll be probably washed out because we're not also thinking about there's still going to be high tide. There's still going to be these extreme hydrological events like the one we saw uh, Harvey hit Houston. We're still going to see these type of events. And so that's why I think when we think about sea level rise, you know, here we've been talking about the multimeter scenario. And I do think that it is um, pertinent we talk about those. But as pertinent as it may seem, really our civilization can't handle one or two feet above the present level. Um, and so these numbers, uh, three feet, four feet, uh, six feet, eight, 12, 15 feet by the end of the century are so beyond um, already the catastrophic limit. I mean, really, uh, in my conversation with Dr. James White, um, who's a paleoclimatologist at the Colorado Boulder Institute, um, who's looked at this, his estimation was that two feet would be a global disaster for a lot of the reasons that uh, Jennifer just went into uh, beyond just our infrastructure, but also our ability to grow food. I mean, these most um, fertilized, fertile lands are really going to, I mean, they're going to be completely destroyed. Um, and that's not at um, two and a half meters or something like that. That's what we see at another one or two, three feet. Uh, so, so that's why it hits so home to me is that um, this is going to be the course of my life. This is what um, is in store. Uh, and this is quite apart now from well, what if, what if, uh, you know, we do get the worst case scenario of missions pathway by the end of the century? That's not how sea level rise works, right? Um, the amount of sea level rise we get in 2100 gets locked in decades beforehand. Um, and, and, and maybe, I mean, it's hard to even tell. I mean, have we even locked, are, are these locked in? Are there chances that even if we do reduce our carbon emission, Will that have any impact on the amount of sea level rise that we get for, for the people of this century? Um, I think those are still questions to, to, to be asked. But again, the range is so great that they almost seem irrelevant questions to be asking. Yeah, I agree. Um, Nick, I was wondering if you would take us through this really good article from William and Mary. Uh, it's called U.S. Sea Level Report Cards 2020, Again, Trends Towards Acceleration. This was a really good article, and it's quite rich. So uh, William and Mary's Virginia Institute of Marine Science uh, came out with an animal or annual report card on sea level rise um, at tidal stations along the U.S. Uh, coastline. And nearly all tidal stations exhibited an accelerated rate of sea level rise. Um, East Coast stations um, have had uh, accelerating sea level rise since about 2014. Um, there was 5.4 millimeters per year, or 0.21 inches per year of sea level rise in Norfolk, Virginia, for example. There's been accelerating Civil rise in most Gulf Coast stations, uh, Grand Isle, Louisiana, for example, has seen uh, 8.1 millimeters per year since uh, with accelerating sea level rise since about 2014. Uh, so it, you're seeing a lot of evidence 
of sea level rise being caused by both the uh, expansion and rise of the ocean, but also in some places such as coastal Louisiana, um, substance where the land is actually sinking. And some of that substance is being caused by human activity um, along the Mississippi River, for example, the damming of the Mississippi, less sediment going to coastal Louisiana and to replace land that's sinking. So you're getting a net um, acceleration in the sinking with acceleration in sea level rise as well so a net rise net accelerating rise in sea level and they do some projections out to the year 2050 for some of their tide gauges and they show uh, for example a non-linear accelerating rise of of uh, to of uh, 0.51 meters of so about half a meter of sea level rise at Norfolk Virginia uh, compared to in compared to now, uh, so your uh, local rise, local sea level rise can be in some cases greater than what you're seeing overall planet wide in terms of the average sea level rise. So there's going to be a lot of places that are going to be dealing with very severe uh, sea level rise um, that's faster than what's going on on average globally over the course of the next 20, 30 years. And obviously it has implications for everything that we've discussed, you know, from infrastructure to to uh, uh, housing, to agriculture and things of that nature. So I thought this was a very good article. So uh, folks can check that out. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, Nick. Um, another article that came up in SF Gate it's uh, as storm sets up to pummel Tahoe, meteorologists forecast a future without snow. And this actually isn't too long. I'll see if I can summarize it. But uh, essentially, there's an atmospheric river that's taking aim at California, which is significant. So, poor California, one week it's fires, the next it's feet upon feet of snow. In the middle of January, high winds and dry conditions sparked wildfires throughout California. Poor California had so many wildfires this last year. Now an atmospheric river is taking aim at the state with a huge amount of water. In the Sierra, Sierra Nevada and Lake Tahoe region, Forecasters are calling between three and six feet of snow by the end of the week. This kind of dramatic shift from fire to fire hose is something California is already used to. But the tick-tock between the extremes, or what climate uh, researchers call precipitation whiplash, will only become more exaggerated as the climate crisis plays out now and in the near future. As the year's first major storm arrived in Lake Tahoe, meteorolog meteorologists and climate scientists convened on the South Shore this week for the 24th Operation Sierra Storm, a leading nationwide conference about weather. Due to the pandemic, attendance was limited. We don't care about that. Panelists forecast a grim outlook for the rest of the century. Climate models predict that storms like the one arriving this week will deliver more rain than snow to Lake Tahoe, a warming trend that will wreak havoc on future ski days and probably other things as well. So according to the panel, the impacts of the climate crisis are already unfolding right now. The future, I think, is here in California and Nevada. Climate change has arrived. We're already living in a different place than when 20th century policies, water management, and infrastructure and flood control developed. So California is becoming both wetter and drier, and it's a paradox with fewer storms offset by extended dry seasons. But when the storms do come, they will be more intense. Winter or the wet season will become narrower and narrower, bookended by longer and drier falls and springs. 
That also means that fire season will extend with climate crisis driving larger and more intense wildfires. So, you know, if you have this much snow, you know, three to six feet or something like that, and then it actually isn't snow, you, what that means is that the land is going to have to absorb all that deluge of water without the benefit of it melting gradually over time. So that's going to really affect um, water delivery and storing water as well. And it probably could cause giant floods. Um, yeah. They, uh, so this, yeah. I was just going to say, so this uh, climate dynamic that, that they're talking about evolving where you have, um, it's something that uh, climate models are seeing for a lot of part, many parts of the world. I've, I've noticed mm -hmm. um, where you get a, a shortened wet season it's more intense, more intense rainfall, um, and for mountainous terrain, more rain than snow because of rising um, freezing levels because of global warming, regional warming. And then you get dry seasons that are longer and also more intense. So it's just a, a very almost bipolar type of phenomenon where it just gets very, very wet relatively briefly, then very dry for a prolonged period of time. And then you're losing, um, and even the water that you're getting uh, doesn't get stored in, as ice in, in the form of snow anymore because of rising uh, freezing levels. So uh, you end up dealing with a lot more flooding in the winter time because all that water just runs downhill and you get massive amounts of erosion and then everything dries out and you don't get the benefit of that water storage from the winter time in the summer because you don't have any more snow. <laughs> so it, it has, it has implications for agriculture, has implications for drinking water, um, has implications for you know ecosystems that may depend on water on water on their own during the summer hot summers that are going to get hotter at Lake Tahoe and everywhere else uh, because you don't have that that storage from the winter time carrying over into the spring and summer months. So uh, it's a it's it's a scenario that's. Uh, devastating on multiple fronts, you know. And there are a lot of um, ecological implications, like you say, Nick, and uh, both you and Jennifer have touched a little bit on what I think will become an increasingly important dynamic, and that is this uh, transport of soil to the ocean. Um, we are losing a lot of terrestrial land uh, due to this process, and uh, it's causing a multitude of different problems on the coast. Um, Deoxygenation of, of the water, um, we see algae booms in response to it. Um, and of course, I mean, these problems, again, are just exploding. And uh, one of the worst episodes, or excuse me, scenarios of climate change is that, you know, as global average temperature rises, we're going to see that um, the land is going to be degraded quite sharply because you have these runoff effects where you're having these extreme fires, right, um, that make the land vulnerable, that remove um, the foliage and the brush uh, whose roots hold the soil together. Um, and then you have these deluges which transport massive amounts of earth uh, into the waterways. Um, and this is, you know, becomes a toxifying effect on local streams, rivers, um, lakes, and of course the ocean. Um, and so this is what I mean by saying as we go into the next section, talking about, so, you know, possible solutions or what I like to say responses uh, to climate change is because although we respond to climate change um, very directly as humans, right? So in some places we will put up seawalls, right? Some places we we will uh, do 
uh, strategic abandonment of the coast. Some places will have floating cities, but you have to understand that these uh, adaptations that humans may employ do not solve the crisis, right? Because the ecology, the biosphere is still being degraded by the ongoing changes with the ocean and the atmosphere, um, which are feeding on one another, of course. Uh, so that's why I think people need to have in mind when we talk about these changes is that uh, climate change not only impacts human systems, but it, it impacts uh, the greater ecology for which our human systems uh, need to survive. Uh, and we see that in this particular instance, how dynamic climate change and sea level rise uh, impacts can be just localized for the state of California, um, which is, of course, suffering from sea level rise as, as well. I agree with you, Antonio. I think that solution is really a misnomer in this case because I don't really see a way out of this predicament. I think the best that we can do is mitigate and adapt. So adaptation, creative adaptation is going to be key for the continuation of civilization for humanity. Um, regarding those floating cities, they actually do have floating cities that are evolving today in the Netherlands. And of course, the Netherlands, you know, that land has been subsiding on its own you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years that we know about probably prior to that. And it's very, very evident if you look at the coastline of the Netherlands and see all the little fingers and inlets and that they have really been so creative over the last many hundred years, you know, 500 years or so in pumping the water out of the land, you know, with their dikes and their windmills and everything like that. Well, now they've taken to actually building whole communities that float and that can be raised um, as, you know, the sea level because they're all on pontoons and they're anchored with cables. So those cables can be adjusted and so they can actually raise as the sea level rises. So that is one way to mitigate. But what we can be sure is that life in the future is not really going to look like life is today. Certainly, I think that, um, you know, in my own personal activism on this particular issue, I confronted the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and I asked him this very same question, NOAA is projecting that we are going to see a likelihood of eight to 10 feet by the end of the century. How do you prepare our nuclear facilities? And the image that they left me with, which uh, I'll have to have later seen, but was essentially of these lone standing nuclear power plants, right? Uh, they were the only thing that was dry around a now water wasteland. And I'm talking to the nuclear regulator with this idea of, are we really going to have uh, nuclear facilities kind of cornered or blockade off, right? That there's going to be sandbags and some type of wall um, and pumping systems and drainage systems and watertight doors. Is that really what the future of nuclear facilities is going to look like in the face of sea level rise? Um, and the reality is no. Um, of course, that's, that, that's not going to be, uh, that may be something that countries do, I think, initially, um, perhaps to prolong damage to these facilities as they begin decommissioning them. But Jennifer, you're right. The world that we're headed into, not, not in 2100, but really in 2030, 2040 and beyond, um, is going to be dynamically different than the world that we currently have. And uh, if I get to live to be my grandfather's age, we will need new world maps. Yeah. We need people like you in the future, Antonia. We want you to live a good long life. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I think we've probably come to the end of our discussion. I was wondering, Nick, if you had any uh, final parting thoughts to sort of summarize the state of the planet in terms of sea level rise? So I think when it comes to, um, you know, sea level rise, it's probably the single or one of the single greatest threats that we face and it's not it's not necessarily the most dramatic i mean we talk about you know methane pouring out of the arctic we talk about the loss of sea ice we talk about a lot of things but um the the 70 percent of the earth's surface is covered with water i mean it it dominates this planet i mean it it it, it dominates um the warming of the world you know it's absorbing most of the heat um, that's being brought back to earth's surface it's acidifying severely from all the carbon dioxide is absorbing and obviously it's expanding and as it warms and it's rising as the as it expands and as the glaciers melt off the land so i think from 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 housing to the ports and economy to agriculture, uh, ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, it, it its rise is going to be felt in every aspect of of of, of life for life on this planet. So it, I think it, it I think it's the most significant um, uh, threat we face, and it's a threat that's unavoidable. You know, it's going to rise. It's rising now. It's been doing it for obviously uh, thousands of years. It's been rising, but it's now accelerating dramatically because of what humans have done to the planet's atmosphere uh, and trapping all these all this heat from all these greenhouse gases. And and so we're just going to have to deal with that. And how much how we deal with how fast it is, I don't know if anyone truly knows. Um, although we're starting to get an inkling that it's going to be um, a truly extreme rise in sea level this century. And I mean, 20, 20 years of the century is, is, is done and over with now. So uh, we're going to continue to be facing uh, uh, challenges, to put it mildly, <laughs> um, through, for the rest of the, for the remaining, you know, 79 you know, 80 years that we are uh, have left in this century and beyond that uh, for any humans that are, that are still around that, that have to deal with the loss of, uh, loss of everything from the re relentless rise of the water. So uh, I think it, it, it's, it's going to be defining, absolutely defining for human civilization, uh, sea level rise. Agreed. Well, it's been a most interesting discussion that we've had tonight with uh, both of you, Nick, Antonio, and uh, so happy that we got to share our thoughts together about this threat of sea level rise and how it's going to affect civilization. So thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.